Hi there and welcome back to another video on A-Level Law. Today we're going to be talking about the defences of duress and necessity. Um, okay, so let's start by looking at duress. Uh, there are two different defences under duress, duress by threats and duress of circumstances. Um, duress is a general defence, which means it's a full defence, so if you complete it, it results in an acquittal. And the burden of proof uh, is on the prosecution for these, so we'll look at that as well. Uh, we're going to start by exploring duress uh, by threats, then we'll move on to duress of circumstances, uh, and we'll finish by looking at necessity on this video. Okay, so we're going to start with duress by threats. Uh, now this is a common law test, there's no statute on this, there's no act of parliament on this. Um, and essentially it's decommitting offence because he had been threatened with death or serious injury. Um, so that's essentially the test. They literally did it uh, because you had little or no choice um, because someone was threatening you with death or serious injury. That's the only reason you commit the crime. Commit the crime. So it's excusatory, so it's excusing what you've done basically um, and justifiably because, you know, if someone was threatening you with death to steal a you know, a phone or something like that, you know, the worst evil is to steal the phone and save your own life, really, in that regards. Um, so you can sort of understand it, why people would do that. Now, um, there are lots of limitations to this, uh, which we need to go through. So you can see it's one to 10, and that's the easy way to learn this, um, is learn it literally one to 10 and learn, you can shorthand them down, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so we're gonna work our way through each of these lists. Um, so we're gonna start with number one, uh, what must the threat be about? Uh, the threat has to be of death or serious harm to so GBH. It can't be anything else. It can't be a threat uh, to disclose someone's homosexuality, for instance, which you see in one case. It can't be um, a threat to do with like money. It can't be anything like that. It's got to be a threat of death or serious harm. So go and do this crime or I'll kill you or go, go and do this crime or I'll break your legs or something like that. Um, now, we saw this in the case of McGrath's case, which is a really old case. You can see there, 1746. Um, it was during a rebellion and they threatened to burn down all their buildings unless they joined the rebellion. Um, and they did join the rebellion and then tried to use that as an excuse, tried to use duress as a defence. And they said, no, it's not. It has to be a threat of death or serious injury, not a threat to damage property. Um, so although it seems fairly unfair in that case, they said, no, it wasn't enough. It has to be a threat of death or serious injury. So that's the first thing to look out for in a scenario. Is there a threat of death or serious injury? Because if there's not, then you can't use the defence. Number two, um, who has to be threatened? Previously, it was very strict. It had to be against you or your family. Um, obviously, family was an old-fashioned term then because it meant like your spouse or your children, your dependents, things like that. Obviously, in modern-day relationships, we don't necessarily, not everybody gets married and things like that, so there's difficulties there. Um, and in an RB right in 2000, it has it developed to include anyone you feel responsible for. So in RB right, um, her boyfriend was threatened unless she smuggled drugs. Um, and they said on appeal, actually, that was fine. Like the threat was against her boyfriend. Obviously, she was responsible for her boyfriend, so that was fine. So she could use the defense of duress. So it isn't just your family and people uh, and you, for instance. It can be someone you feel responsible for. So it could be a grandmother, but all that probably would come under family, to be fair. But boyfriend, girlfriend, that sort of thing as well. Potentially a best friend, um, maybe, although we're not super clear on that. Um, number three, does it include a threat of serious psychological injury? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so Bacon Wilkins, they said it can't include this, it has to be a threat of de uh, death or serious injury, it cannot be a threat of serious psychological injury, it has to be serious physical injury, so GBH, etc. Um, Bacon Wilkins is actually a duress of circumstances case, uh, they broke down a door to get to their child who was inside, being locked inside, um, and they tried to use the duress of uh, circumstances as a threat serious psychological really said no so that applies to dress by threats as well so it cannot be a threat of serious psychological injury um very rarely comes up it's quite hard to word that and come up with a scenario where that would be included so it usually ignores that sort of bit so don't worry too much about it uh, number four does it have to be the only threat um no uh, there can be multiple threats are allowed to be considered as long as one of the threats is death or serious injury so in valderrama vega uh, the trial judge said only the, the defense was only available if death threats were the sole reason um the court would actually quashed that conviction uh, as they said actually you can look at the cumulative effects of all the threats so you can consider all the threats as long as one of them is a threat of death or serious injury as I said earlier, if there is no death or th uh, threat of death or serious injury, you can't. So say it was only um, to disclose like homosexuality and someone was in debt, that wouldn't be enough. But in Valderrama Vega, it was both of the, the threat was both of those things um, and uh, a threat of death 
uh, unless he imported some cocaine. So actually, he said, well, one of them is a threat of de um, death there, so they can actually consider the other threats as well. Uh, but it couldn't just be those threats, if that makes sense. Number five, uh, there has to be a link between the threat and the crime committed. Uh, they call this a nexus. There has to be a sufficient nexus. So basically what this means is the person must tell them to commit the offence and link this to the threat. So go and rob that petrol station over there or I will kill you. Um, if I just said, if it just said like, I will kill you unless you get me this money and then you decide to rob a petrol station, that's not a link because they haven't told you to do that. You could have gone and got a loan, you could have done other things, you could have borrowed money, they didn't tell you to go and commit a crime. So that wouldn't be a defence. There'd be no nexus there. In RV Cole, um, they threatened his girlfriend and a child, um, and unless they, they got, he got their money back for them, uh, and he decided to rob two building societies. And again, that showed there was no nexus there because he didn't choose, uh, oh, sorry, he did choose to do the offence. He didn't have to do that. He could have found another method, a uh, legal method, for instance. Number six, uh, what if there is an opportunity to escape? Um, in RV Gill, uh, his family were threatened unless he stole um, a lorry and he was left alone for a big period of time and he could have run away at that point. Um, so they said he can't use the defence of duress because he had an opportunity to escape. Uh, one of the difficulties in here is around, well, what if people believe that police protection would be unreliable or not enough to protect them, maybe from like a mafia type institution? What if the person threatening said, well, we've got people on the pay in the police force, and things like that. Would you feel like the police protection was enough? This was covered in Hudson and Taylor. So in Hudson and Taylor, two women were going into court to give evidence. They were threatened before entering the court and the man that threatened them sat in the public gallery and watched them and then they gave false evidence. Um, and the Court of Appeal actually said in this, when it got up to the Court of Appeal, if the defendant reasonably believed that the police could not protect the defendant, uh, their duress should still be available. So actually, if they didn't seek police protection but could have, but they didn't, they didn't do it because they feared they wouldn't be protected by them, then they could still use the defence of duress. Now that has now been overruled by RV Hassan. So the law lords in RV Hassan returned to a more rigid position and said that the defendant must seek police protection if an opportunity arises and they won't hear anything around sort of them, they're not thinking the police can protect them or anything like that. The assumption is you have to go to the police. So it's a much more stricter approach again. Number seven, how imminent does the threat have to be? So uh, is it, you know, how, when I make the threat to go into the crime, how, when's the threat actually going to happen if I'm saying it? When am I actually going to do what I'm saying I'm going to do? Um, in AGV Wheelan, uh, he was handling stolen goods and he'd been threatened with death or GBH. Um, and they indicated uh, address by threats might be available where the defendant has been subject to a threat of immediate uh, death or serious injury. So they came up with the word immediate, it has to be immediate. Um, Hudson and Taylor, we've already covered the facts about that, so going to court one. Uh, they held that it should be interpreted more widely as imminent, and that's the Court of Appeal in that case. But again, you can see a more rigid approach from the uh, Law Lords and House of Lords in RV Hassan, which rejected the idea of immediate or imminent, and they said they preferred the term immediate or almost immediate. So, you know, they're all playing around with similar terms there. They all pretty much mean the same thing, but the current terminology would be immediate or almost immediate from the most recent precedent of RV Hassan. Number eight, uh, what if the duress is self-induced? Uh, there's a long list of cases we're going to go through here, uh, culminating in RV Hassan again, which is a rigid approach. Um, so sort of just, you don't have to necessarily learn all these cases, but I'm just going to talk you through the history of it um, and you'll see sort of how it's developed. Um, RV Fitzpatrick, he joined the IRA um, and uh, they said they would kill him and his mum uh, unless he took part in a robbery. Uh, and the law here was if the defendant voluntarily became involved with an illegal organisation, knowing the crimes they committed, they couldn't use duress. They'd say it was self-induced. They'd say, well, you got yourself into it. You knew they were going to do these sort of crimes. You can't use duress. Um, RV Sharp uh, confirmed this approach. He took part in an armed robbery based on a threat of death or serious harm again. Um, RV Shepherd. Uh, actually slightly modified this. He said if they joined in ignorance, so they didn't know that they would be asked to go and do these sort of crimes and had no idea they were violent or anything like that, then they might actually be able to use the defence. So in Shepherd, he joined a gang and didn't know that they used violence. He just thought they stole stuff. He didn't know they used violence. Um, RV Ali uh, sort of extended this principle of self-induced quite extensively. Um, it extended to cover not just who joined gangs, but people who voluntarily associated with a violent individual. So it wouldn't just be about joining a gang if you self-induced. If you hang around with someone that you know was violent and then they threatened you to do a crime, so put you under duress, you wouldn't be able to use duress. 
Um, in Ali, he, he was told to rob a bank or he'd be killed, and he, he hung around with this person. He knew he was violent and continued to hang around with him, and then they threatened him. So the court said, no, you can't use it. Uh, Baker and Ward, uh, it was a robbery or a threat of death again, so I was to do the robbery or we'll kill him. Uh, and they held that the defendants had to be aware of the type of crime that they might uh, be made to commit for duress to be available. Um, so they had to, so they had to, um, uh, so if they knew that they would be asked to do it, if they kind of knew that they, the gang did this sort of thing and threatened them, they probably wouldn't be able to use it if they knew that they threatened them to do that sort of crime. So it's sort of a weird case, to be honest, and that has, as I said, been overruled. Uh, R.V. Heath, um, it was told to transport drugs or, and it was threatened with death or serious injury again. Um, and they actually rejected the Broken Ward principle. Um, and Hassan actually confirmed that rejection uh, and moved again, like I said, to this harsh interpretation um, where uh, it, uh, basically it's the duress is unavailable if the defendant could have foreseen that he might be forced to commit an offence. So basically it returns back to the strict approach. If you join a gang, you know they're violent. If you hang around with someone, you know they're violent. An individual, you can't use the defence of duress. So Hassan, he was involved with a violent drug dealer and he was told to steal money by his violent drug dealer or he would be killed or seriously harmed. Uh, and the court said, no, you can't use it because it's self-induced. So that's the most strict approach with that. We are at where we are now. Hassan is the most recent precedent, so you can't use it if you hang around uh, with a violent gang or join a violent gang or a violent individual. Um, murder. Uh, you can't use it for murder uh, or attempt to murder and possibly treason, although we're not going to talk about treason. Um, but you can't use it for murder or attempt to murder. It's just full stop. Absolutely not. Uh, the main case on this is how uh, he was involved in torturing and killing an individual. Uh, he didn't really do anything in that instance, but then he, they then killed and tortured another man. And he was told to strangle the man in this instance, and he did. And he said he only did so because he was threatened in that instance. Um, this overall, so how, how overruled the previous case of uh, DPP for Northern Ireland v Lynch, which said it was, you could use it for murder. Um, and they said, no, they said, you can't use it for murder. And Lord Helsham actually said, you can see the quote here, I do not at all accept in relation to the defence of murder, it is either good morals, good policy or good law to suggest that the ordinary man of reasonable fortitude is not to be supposed to be capable of heroism if he is asked to take an innocent life rather than sacrifice his own. So basically, you can't decide that your life is worth more than someone else's. You need to be heroic and sacrifice yourself, basically, uh, is the law's approach, which in, we'll talk about in the A3 is whether that's going you know, to make sense or realistic or not. Uh, Wilson, uh, he was a 13-year-old boy told to kill his mum, uh, and he was basically told to kill his mum by his dad. And his dad threatened to like kill him or seriously harm him if he didn't. So really unpleasant case uh, he did. And he wasn't able to use the defensive dress, which is very controversial. We'll talk about that uh, in due course. Uh, as I said, you can't use it for attempted murder either. In how it was suggested by the House of Lords in Obiter, so remember Obiter is persuasive precedent, it's not binding, it's not ratio, um, and said the defence should not be available on a charge of attempted murder. Um, Gotts actually turned that uh, Obiter into ratio, so several years later, five years later, and said, actually, yeah, you can't use it for attempted murder. And Gotts was a 16-year-old boy who was threatened by his father to stab his mother again. So a similar sort of uh, case to Wilson. Uh, but he obviously tried to kill her but didn't succeed, as hence why it's attempted murder. Um, so that's what got uh, changed. Uh, what so once you've established whether someone can use duress or not, so you've gone through those limitations, and it's all fine, there is a threat of death or serious injury, you know, uh, there is a nexus, there's nothing that's saying you can't use it, it wasn't self-induced, um, and nothing like that, it was immediate, you know, you've covered over all the bases. The courts will then apply the Graham test. Now in Graham, uh, he was a homosexual who lived with uh, his wife and his boyfriend. And his boyfriend didn't like his wife and decided he wanted to kill her. Um, and he basically threatened him and said, kill her or, you know, I'll harm you. And he did. And he said he felt like he had to do it. Um, so he killed his wife. Um, now, they came up with a test in this. And the test is two parts. One, which is subjective. And two, which is objective. So number one is, was the defendant forced to act as they did? Because as a result of what they reasonably believed, they feared serious injury or death. Uh, so that's the subjective. What did the defendant think? And then two, would a sober person of reasonable fairness, sharing the characteristics of the defendant, have acted in the same way? And that's the objective, comparing it to the normal person, average person, reasonable person. So you have to ask yourself both those questions, ask the jury both those questions, uh, or the magistrates, and only then can you um, obviously use them if you tick both off. Uh, then you can use duress. Um, R.V. Martin, uh, which we'll come back to in a second in terms of facts uh, on the next bit. 
Uh, the court will decide that the jury could take into account any characteristics which would make the defendant genuinely fear for his or her safety if the threat was actually mistaken and therefore unreasonable. Um, RV Hassan, five years later, insisted that Dee's belief in the threat must be both genuinely and reasonably held. Um, and the burden of proof is always on the prosecution, although it is the defendant who would raise evidence of duress, so they would bring it up in the first instance. Um, in terms of changes to Graham, Bowen uh, sort of set out a list of these characteristics that would be okay and some that weren't okay. Uh, in Bowen, uh, they, uh, him and his father were threatened uh, unless he committed a crime. Uh, he had very low IQ. Um, and the characteristics they said were okay uh, would to be taken into account for the reasonable person would be sex, age, pregnancy, serious physical disability, uh, mental impairment or PTSD, something like that. They said you can't consider excessive vulnerability or timidity uh, or low IQ. So that basically the court said just because someone's got a low IQ doesn't mean they're not capable of heroism and capable of uh, saying no and not doing it. You know, they said that someone still can stand up and say no, even if they've got a low IQ. Um, and they won't take into account vulnerability or timidity because timidity, you expect uh, the person, if we go back a minute, to uh, the second part of the Graham test, a so person of reasonable firmness. So you're automatically assuming that they're not timid uh, or weak uh, or vulnerable in any in, in that regard. So that won't be allowed. Um, the draft criminal code issued by the Law Commission, uh, obviously many, many years ago, sought to change this uh, and put it firmly on a subjective footing. So to get rid of uh, the objective part, uh, but Parliament didn't take that up. Equally, intoxication can't be uh, looked at either. So RV Flat, uh, he was a drug addict, uh, and he they uh, they basically said uh, they would kill his grandmother, mother, and girlfriend if he didn't take possession of some drugs. Um, and they said intoxication can't be used as a characteristic, and that's due to public policy considerations. They can't allow voluntary intoxication to be considered. If you look at the topic of intoxication, you'll sort of follow that. Um, so that's duress by threats. Moving on to duress of circumstances. Uh, again, it's a common law defence. Uh, it's based around a perceived threat of danger, of death or serious injury in the circumstances rather than a direct threat. It can be a threat, but it's usually, it could be, it usually is the circumstances you're in that's kind of, it's going to kill you or cause you serious injury unless you commit this crime. Um, so a classic example they tend to use is imagine like a tidal wave coming uh, towards you and your only avenue of escape is to drive up a one-way street the wrong way. So you commit that crime to save yourself from being killed or being seriously injured by the tidal wave. So you claim duress of circumstances for the crime of driving the wrong way up a one-way street, if that makes sense. Uh, the main case on this is RV Martin. Uh, he was disqualified from driving and his wife said she would kill herself if she didn't, if he didn't take uh, their son to work, so fairly dramatic and extreme. Uh, so he did, he committed the crime, obviously driving whilst disqualified, but he said he did it because he threw it, feared the threat of death of his wife, uh, you know, in terms of it. Uh, so they actually came up with a test in Alvin Martin, uh, which was, did uh, the defendant act reasonably and proportionately to avoid a threat of death or serious injury or harm? So did they act reasonably and proportionately to avoid that threat? And then you'd apply the two-part Graham test in the same way. So was D forced to act as they did because of the threat? And um, would a sober person of reasonable furnace share the characteristics of D have acted in the same way? So it's fairly flexible, actually, and is used to actually avoid the sort of rigidity of the duress by threats uh, example. Um, there's a couple of more cases on this. RV Conway, he was caught speeding after he believed he had been shot at. Um, so again, he could use the defence of duress of circumstances. And DPPV Davis, he was caught during driving, during driving after he did so to avoid being attacked. And again, he could use the defence of uh, duress of circumstances. So um, they have also confirmed in a case called Pommel where that it doesn't just apply to driving cases, you can apply it to other things as well. So uh, it's a fairly wide defence uh, in that regards. Finally, separate defence, which is necessity. Uh, REA actually sets this out. REA was uh, two conjoined twins uh, that they knew they needed to separate, otherwise they were both going to die, but they knew separating them would kill one of them. Uh, and they knew which one, so they were worried that that would therefore be murder. So they went to the courts to get some clarification on this and whether they could do it quickly. Um, and they did get clarification in the end and said they could, uh, but that wasn't under necessity, it was actually under self-defence, so bear that in mind. But they did set out the test uh, for necessity, and the test is as follows. Was the act done to prevent an act of greater evil from occurring? Was the evil directed towards the defendant or someone they feel responsible for? And was the act reasonable proportionate to the evil? Um, now we can see in RV Dudley and Stevens, 
a much older case, uh, what was it called, the cabin boy case. They were adrift from sea because they were in a lifeboat and um, they killed a cabin boy to survive. Uh, and they tried to claim necessity when they got back uh, and the courts refused to allow it for murder. They said it cannot be used for murder in the same way that duress by threats can't be. Um, and they were sentenced to be hung or hanged. Uh, but the Queen actually did pardon them in that case, which is irrelevant because it's still the law. They were still guilty. You can't use uh, necessity for murder, but it's just interesting nonetheless. Um, so that's necessity and that's stress of circumstances. They're very short topics compared to dress by threat. So dress by threats is by far the, the most detailed one, but you need to be aware of the other two just in case. Moving on to AO3. Uh, AO3 covers... Uh, all of the points here, so it covers duress by threat, duress of circumstances and necessity. So uh, the last couple of points are specifically around duress of circumstances and necessity. The rest are really, uh, one to eight, are really duress by threat. So just bear that in mind. First big A3 point is that it's all defined in common law again. So you've got the same issues with judicial lawmaking, separation of powers. Remember Montesquieu came up with separation of powers idea. Um, parliamentary supremacy, you know, you've got the idea here that this is very serious defence um, and all the laws have been set out by judges. Is that really fair? Should Parliament not get involved? Why are they not got involved? Do they lack the political will? All those sort of uh, considerations you can make around the evaluation there. Number two, a uh, huge number of limitations. You can see it's one to ten really in saying sort of rules and controls around it. Uh, and that's really stop overuse or abuse of the defence, really, because people, you know, particularly the public, don't like excuses for people committing crimes. Uh, and obviously, duress is a big excuse that can potentially be abused and said, oh, well, they threatened me. Um, you can see in a lot of cases where that's happened, where they've joined gangs and things like that. You now, they don't tend to be that receptive to that. Um, McGrover, also, you can see it's limited in terms of uh, type of threat. So McGrover burning down all the buildings was not enough. That just seems slightly unfair. You know, we're going to burn down your entire village and, and that didn't count as duress. Uh, but that's the sort of strict interpretation they've gone with it. Harvey Wright uh, was actually a positive widening of the defence, I would say, uh, because it included people who you feel responsible for, not just your family and you. Uh, and that actually reflects real life situations nowadays and changes in society, really, that they need to take that into account. So that's a massive positive, uh, positive point there. Um, Hudson and Taylor it seemed to relax the rule around seeking police protection uh, if you feared that police could not protect you. Uh, that seems fair, you know, in some circumstances you can certainly see if there's mafia type organisations and making threats to you, as I said, about the police being on the payroll. You might think, well, actually, the police can't protect me. Um, but as we know, Hassan has removed that and reversed that and gone back to the very strict approach that you must go to the police. Um, under any circumstances um, and that's probably based on the idea that you can't assume people would be you know people could use it as justification and say well I thought the police couldn't protect me and it'd just be another way around using it and you know avoid people being able to avoid being criminally responsible and using defensive duress uh, so I think they, they prefer the strict approach with it um, and you, Hassan is strict in every avenue it decided you can see Hassan comes up multiple times uh, making the law more uh, strict actually and harsher. Uh, there's still uncertainty around what immediacy really means. Uh, the courts have to and fro between interpretations, but they've most recently settled on immediate or almost immediate in Arbia San. Still highly subjective and uncertain what that means. You know, it doesn't give you an actual time frame of when the threat has to happen. Um, so it can be unclear, but it's obviously done on a case by case basis, which is flexible and has benefits as well. Number six, uh, huge judicial agreement over law around self-induced duress. Uh, as you can see, there were sort of eight, nine, ten, you know, ten cases uh, toing and froing uh, about what the law should be, with huge judicial disagreement, um, culminating in the strict interpretation again under RVSM, uh, which is that you can't use it if you know the gang you joined a violent gang or a violent individual and tough luck basically. Um, but the big point is here: if, if the judges are disagreeing, how can the law be clear? There's such enormous disagreement between judges on this. Um, so there's some really uncertainty there about whether the law we currently have under Harvey Hassan is correct. Although bear in mind that was the House of Lords, so it is obviously a very top precedent uh, which binds the rest of uh, the courts. And obviously they'd have to use the practice statement to change that. Um, so if you've gone over and realised precedent, you should know what the practice statement is. Um, number seven, uh, duress is not available for murder or attempted murder. Um, it's based around sanctity of life, really, that you can't decide that your life is worth more than someone else's. And it's go back to religious ideas, really, that only God can decide that. But, you know, is that really realistic? What about if the threat was against your family members? It seems particularly unlikely. You know, would people really not then kill the stranger or kill someone to save their own family? Um, also seems particularly harsh in cases like RV Wilson with the son, the 13-year-old boy. Um, you know, it, didn't, it doesn't allow for personal characteristics such as maturity to be considered. 
Uh, it just seems a bit unfair, the application, particularly in Harvey Wilson with a 13-year-old boy that he couldn't use duress and essentially, you know, was getting a, uh, a Manchester United sentence. So he was um, 13, so he was detained at Majesty's Pleasure instead, which is the sort of um, equivalent for children. Um, number eight, the Graham test contains two limbs, subjective and objective. So it's good that it considers both. It looks at what the defender thought and compares them to a reasonable person. Um, the you know, question here, could it follow the same way as Ivy, uh, which is getting rid of the subjective part and focusing purely on objective? Um, although, remember, that is a completely different area of law. It's talking about theft. This is a completely different area of law, so there's no suggestion that might happen, but just a little idea there. Um, equally, do you remember, the, I mentioned the Law Commission so it's moving the opposite way, actually, just going to the subjective term, but that obviously was rejected in the draft criminal code. And obviously, when you're talking about objective tests, always the question is, well, who is the reasonable man? You know, we've always got questions around uh, uncertainty and inconsistency with uh, juries and magistrates making different decisions and things like that. Uh, number nine, duress of circumstances has evolved to be slightly fairer to compensate for strict interpretation of duress by threats. You know, where duress by threats is so harsh, there is always a backup, perhaps using duress of circumstances, which allows defendants some sort of flexibility. And ten, uh, necessity is incredibly limited, and it's not allowed for murder, as we saw from REA and Dudley and Stevens. Um, but interestingly, if we look at Canada, in a case called Perker et al. Uh, v. the Queen, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada held that necessity is an excuse where the harm inflicted by the defendant is less than the harm threatened. Um, and they actually allow the defence much more widely than English judges, who actually quite often refuse to even recognise the defence. Um, and you can see actually one of the judges, the English judges here, Edmund Davies, stated that the law regards with the deepest suspicion any remedies of self-help and permits those remedies to be resorted to only in very special circumstances. The reason for such circumspection is clear. Necessity can very easily become simply a mask for anarchy. So basically, people are using it as an excuse uh, and they don't want people doing it. So it's too easy to use as an excuse. So, oh, it was necessary for me to do. It was avoiding a greater evil. And they said, it's not enough. You can't use that. Finally, with scenarios, uh, likely to come up by itself, uh, as there's lots to consider for the defence, and equally you could get something that includes a little, you know, duress by threats and then a little bit of duress by circumstances and nice necessity at the bottom, so you just need to watch out for mentioning those two and look out what the questions are asking. Um, you need to pick out the relevant limitations and apply methodically, so for instance, was there a threat of death or GBH, uh, etc. Was there um, you know, multiple threats? Uh, was there a nexus, all those sort of things you need to go through and sort of make sure you're happy with those uh, and make sure you can actually use the defensive address. And then obviously once you've covered all the limitations, apply the Graham test and say, okay, well, would they, would the jury actually accept um, uh, duress by threats? And that's the massive mistake people usually make. They go for the limitations, but then don't apply Graham at the end. And that's really important you do and then consider any characteristics. They can't often put red herrings, or they're not red herrings, like clues in the... Um, scenario of like characteristics that they then could mention in the Graham test under Bowen. So make sure you have a look at that. And obviously make sure you reach an overall conclusion as to whether or not they can use the defence. I hope you found that useful. Please subscribe if you enjoy these videos uh, as they ha that helps me make more. Um, and hit a like and comment if you've got any questions or anything like that. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.